Hello class, welcome. Lecture on the skin, and then uh, when I see you in person, we'll lecture on bones, and I'll give you a bone lecture on uh, online as well. All right, fascinating topic. Let's get to it. You guys survived the exam. Uh, that was good to see. All right. All right. You guys recognize this. You've seen Body Works, Body World, whatever it's called. Um, that's your skin. You look better with skin. I mean, you see uh, the importance of skin when you lose your skin. You get uh, horrible burns or uh, motorcycle accidents. You'll slide in the pavement. It's called decaloving, where your skin comes off. And you know it's a critical, critical thing, isn't it? You're put into a special room with a plastic tens, and they worry about infection all the time. So severe burns or loss of your skin is critical concern. So it gives you a, a little clue as how important your skin is. It's this beautiful uh, waterproof, uh, microproof uh, organ that also <clears throat> sunlight allows it to change colors and can make vitamin D, even excrete uh, some urea out of your skin and salts. So yeah, yeah, very critical and, uh, and quite a large organ. Maybe you guys have heard it's the largest organ of your body. You may think it's strange to call it an organ. <clears throat> I mean, clearly a heart or a stomach's an organ, but skin, but organs are, you know, have various tissues put together doing a common role. And so when you look at skin, it's stratified squamous epithelium, remember? And then um, a dense irregular connective tissue and then adipose tissue, all these tissues put together to make the skin. And so it is an organ. Uh, besides, I talk about that protection, how it keeps things from getting into us, right? Pathogens in the environment, keeps us from drying out. Um, it's important, it's our, really our only cooling heating system. We'll see this ability to sweat, <clears throat> to shunt blood to your surface and, or not is, is the way we, we get our homeostasis that way. So how big is it? If you were to take all your skin, you saw someone holding the skin in that uh, Body Worlds uh, exhibit. It's gonna make up about two meters square. Think how big that is, two meters. So, you know, it's of course it wraps around all your, your uh, corners and nooks and crannies. Um, 15 to 20% of your body mass. So how much do you weigh? Take 10% of that and double that. So skin can be quite a heavy, uh, heavy organ. And just looking at it, you know, you can see if it weighs 24 pounds, you can see your lungs, <clears throat> the liver, Liver is your biggest internal organ, but uh, in comparison. An expert on the skin, a uh, physician is a dermatologist, of course, and uh, things looking at the skin, I mean, this, uh, the skin is important to our appearance, so there's a lot of uh, plastic surgery, reconstructive type surgery, and then uh, cancer, skin cancer, most common type of cancer, not the deadliest, but the most common, and so uh, uh, your skin is, um, looked at for that quite a bit. So some of the functions, yeah, well, without it, think about without it, how much trouble you're in. I mean, it keeps the moisture in your body, it keeps you from drying out. And then exposed tissue, I mean, the fat or muscle is gonna be a beautiful breeding ground for bacteria and fungi, and et cetera. So our skin protects us from that outside world. And it's even a nice protection because your skin is growing from the, the inside out. It's continuously moving outward. So anything trying to get into your body has to swim against the current because your skin is coming out. You, you slough off dead cells constantly. So yeah, there are some um, rainforest trees that constantly make bark and the bark sloughs off to get rid of the, all the moss that are growing on it. So it's a way for us to renew this surface all the time. Body temperature, huge. <clears throat> we'll talk about that. Your heating and your cooling system, I mean, your skin is involved. And when you sweat, uh, actually, you don't smell bad. Like fresh sweat doesn't smell bad. But it's that stale sweat. Uh, very quickly, some of those things that are secreted, like urea, which is in pee, urine, and salts, they get, uh, they'll get they be fed upon by bacteria, and they'll give off malodorous uh, uh, emanation. So um, the older sweats does smell bad because of the bacteria feeding on that. And sensory. Think about how we sense the world. 
right? Through our skin, the sense of touch, deep touch, vibrations, and, and fine touch, texture, reading braille, and then temperature, right? And so um, we'll talk about that, <clears throat> but your skin is a, is a big uh, sensing organ of your environment around you. What's the temperature? Is there wind? Is there touch? All these things. And we need it for vitamin D production. Um, you'll see your skin uh, can make a precursor to vitamin D, get it from your diet as well. And then UV radiations from the sun will transfer it to another form. And then that form gets transferred in your uh, liver and kidneys to the, the active form of vitamin D. So vitamin D is complicated, uh, has many forms, and, uh, but uh, we need a little bit of sunlight regularly to help us make enough vitamin D. All right, we can take drugs through our skin. We have patches of various kind. Most famous probably nicotine patches to help uh, deliver nicotine or other substances, birth control, other things like that at a, a slow, regular rate. <clears throat> so you need the drug to be able to go through the lipid fatty layer of your skin and uh, you can uh, produce the patch so that it gives a slow release of the drug as opposed to injecting it or taking pills. I don't know about the hangover patch. I found that online. I, I, can't, uh, I can't give a, a test to that if that works or not, but uh, yeah. And just real quick, we'll get to this. Uh, we do endocrine system next semester, but uh, corticosteroids, cortisol cream, things like that, they do work. And so what this is, is a steroid hormone from your adrenal glands. And uh, uh, it goes and it reduces inflammation and pain. And so you'll see we can use this uh, uh, low dose of corticosteroids in a cream to get rid of rashes and um, inflammation makes it feel better, right? Um, but you give off uh, cortisol, corticosteroids, uh, when you're under stress. And so it's a stress hormone. And so the benefit is, yes, reduction of pain and inflammation. But the negative is, is that you're using... Uh, amino acids to, to make sugar, you have higher blood sugar then, but not breaking down carbs the normal way, but you're using proteins. So long-term steroid use is not recommended because um, <clears throat> you end up with a wasting of muscle and, and uh, you're more susceptible to diseases because you need proteins, amino acids to make antibodies too. And so it's cortisol, the corticosteroids are given off in stress environments when you, you need, quick sugar in your blood, and, um, um, but it comes at a cost of um, um, impaired healing and uh, less immune response and uh, less availability of proteins for building your body and, and making antibodies. Oh, I can't even look at this I, uh, um, without feeling a little itchy. Uh, you guys recognize this? Ah, uh, yeah poison ivy, right? And I lived through this real susceptible to it. And then I get it every year because I would radio check rattlesnakes and these rattlesnakes would always be in poison ivy. I know exactly what it looks like and try to avoid it, but it gets on your clothes. And then you end up with this reaction that lasts for weeks. And there's nothing you can do about it. It just weeps and uh, this fluid. Uh, so it is a, here in Maine, it's a problem. And some of you are looking at me like, Never gotten it. Don't know what you're talking about. I mean, you know about poison ivy, but some of you are not susceptible and some are very susceptible. So yeah, it turns out some people have more response than others. And there's even cases where people, the more they're exposed, the more sensitive they are to it. So what it is, is poison ivy is this, this oil or shell, and it's given off by the plant for a good reason. It's to prevent, you know, things from eating it, et cetera. So it's a, it's a toxin given off on purpose by the plant. And just, if it gets into your skin, just touches your skin, this oil, it uh, will bind with proteins in your skin. And then your body recognizes that as foreign and it attacks it. And so that's what makes the, the fluid forming and the redness. And your body just has to fight this off. And it takes, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks, really, to really get rid of it. And you say to yourself, you know, how can, you know, it must be something to get rid of it. Well, it's, it's really difficult because once it binds, it can't just wash it off anymore. So there are products out there to help, you know, if you just got in contact, maybe get rid of some of that oil, but it's almost inevitable if you've exposed to poison ivy. 
and then your window is so narrow to wash it off and then that's it you're just going to have this reaction if you're susceptible and uh they're working on a vaccine a vaccine would be amazing can you imagine just not having to worry about poison ivy some of you haven't because you never got it but those of you out there there's 110 of you so i know some of you are with me and you've gotten that poison ivy and it just nothing stops that itch and it just weeps and it doesn't go away so yeah and uh also uh, if, if you are the susceptible one sometimes mangoes um the the skin of it will, will cause your lips to tingle and such it's in the same family as poison ivy so there's a little cr cross reactivity with with mangoes but they're delicious and i certainly don't avoid them all right, so with the skin, we're going to talk about some of these appendages or are parts of the skin that come out that are so fascinating, like hair. And uh, we'll look at our glands, uh, sweat glands. They make sweat, and there's, there's special ones in your armpit and your groin. And then sebaceous glands make sebum, the oil that's on all of your hair follicles and keeps your skin uh, flexible and your hair flexible. And then nails, fingernails and toenails. Another thing is just the same material as your hair, just put kind of these flat plates. And then including the glands or mammary glands, we'll talk about that. We'll do reproduction next semester, but we'll, uh, we'll introduce it here. All right, so your skin is uh, very thick, of course, on your palms and your, heat, your soles of your feet too. Wicked thick, thickest part of your body. And it's very thin in the, the back of your hand. Your, your eyelids are probably the thinnest skin in your body right there. Very, very thin. So it varies. You can see oh, this, this guy with the hooks in his back here. It's very thick uh, here in the, in the back region. Uh, again, thinner. You can tell, you know where your skin is thinner and thicker, depending on uh, where the yeast is going to be. Oh, gorgeous histology. This is not what you saw for the histology slides, just studying stratified squamous keratinized. Uh, oops. Oh, sorry, showing that. No. <laughs> sorry. There we go, I'm able to draw in there. Um, uh, yeah, indeed, I, I talked about that. Oh, here we go, this one's right here, yeah, yeah. So all of this is dead keratin. It's just, you'll see the cells that are alive and dividing right down here at the bottom. And as they come up, those cells die and they make keratin so that there's nothing left. It's just, there's just a shell of a cell filled with keratin. And then as they come up, this is what sloughs off the dry skin or you have dandruff or dry, the little flakes of skin that come off is gonna be the keratin protein that your skin cells had made and then they die and that's all that they are. So look how thick the skin is. It's on someone's uh, fingertip. All right, so your typical uh, looking skin, again, thick skin. Uh, but what we have here is, this is the epidermis here. So we study that with epithelium, stratified squamous, keratinized. But most of your skin, most of the thickness of your skin is dermis. And dermis is uh, connective tissue. And so it's dense, irregular, most of it. So collagen fibers and elastic fibers going every which way. It gives that toughness to your skin. The epidermis is just that outer, outer layer. And that's what makes leather. Leather is dermis of a cow or a goat or something you got the leather from. It's the collagen fibers, super strong, that gives that strongness to your skin. And then underneath that layer, you can see this, this hypodermis or subcutaneous layer. It's mostly fat. So you store a lot of fat under your skin, right? You know, you store it around your organs and then also under your skin is where you store a lot, a lot of fat. And you know, when you get injections, you get a hypodermic needle, hypodermic needle. And that's uh, a lot of your injections, uh, the needle goes into this fatty layer here where it can be picked up by blood vessels, the drug. And you can have dermal injection too, where you just put it under the skin, like a TB test. They just kind of introduce it right under there. Or an intramuscular injection, where you go even deeper into the muscle, right? So various places to put drugs for various reasons. So take a look, I love it. So you can see this, the um, epidermis is very distinct. The dermis and hypodermis, there's not a real 
clear distinction. You see all the adipose tissue, the fat down there, but there's a collagen fibers go between those two. So there's not a, a sharp line there. They kind of interdigitate and it uh, keeps that fatty layer beneath the dermis and that's gonna connect underneath it to muscles. Yeah. In the epidermis, there's no blood vessels. So all the blood vessels and nerves are in that dermis and hypodermis. They come up there. You can see blood vessels throughout there. All right, so the epidermis has these four layers you need to know. And sometimes there's even a fifth layer, um, but I wanna talk about that. I will show you these, these, these four main layers. And so at the bottom is the stratum basale. So strata means layers. And so that's the basal layer. These are the dividing cells that are the stem cells of your skin. And as soon as they, the daughter cells come from those stem cells, they'll be spinosum. They're kind of spiny and prickly looking. There's a little layer that's granular, shows a lot of pigment. And then corneum is the cornified. It means the, the dead layer on top of it. So makes sense, right? So take another beautiful look at skin. You can see, uh, first of all, one thing you'll notice is that the epidermis and dermis don't just meet like this, do they? They meet like this, like two egg cartons coming together. And the purpose of that is that if they met just flush, and we'll see this with the bones of the skull, they meet like they're these sutures, right? It gives you a lot more strength. If they just met like this, the ability to slide would be much easier. But if you have this interdigitation, it gives you a lot more strength. So with your skin, you want it to move. And you can overdo that. If you overdo it, you'll get a blister. They'll actually will shear apart. But normally this, these little papilla, these little nubbins that come in, they meet like that. It gives it strength right there so that um, it doesn't get torn apart. All right. And we'll take a look at, uh, if we look at the, the epidermis, everything above here, you'll see, uh, although it's, it's convoluted, this lower layer, the, the basal layer be at the bottom, and then spinosum, granulosum, and corneum. So the basal cells uh, will be uh, about cuboidal shaped-ish, so pretty big. And then um, they're constantly dividing, going through mitosis. And uh, they're making their daughter cells come up, and then they start dying. You know, and as soon as you leave that basal layer, that's where the blood is, because blood doesn't go into the epidermis. As soon as you lose the blood and the nutrients and you start moving upward, you start dying, you move away from that basal layer. And uh, the cells themselves, um, they start uh, like dehydrating and shrinking, but they're stuck to each other with these desmosomes. Remember that little spot welds between cells? And so they're stuck together. And so when they start shrinking, they look spiny because they're still stuck by those little desmosomes. And so in that spiny layer, they become going from bigger cells to smaller to smaller to more squished and more pointy. And that's what happens and they start dying. So as soon as a new skin cell is born, it's gonna die. Within a month, it's gonna be dead and it's gonna slough off. Yeah. And on its way journey up, it just fills up with keratin. It makes a bunch of this protein keratin. And that's gonna give you this nice waterproofing uh, protein layer on the outside of your skin. What do you guys think? Basal layer, dividing cells, they're dying as they move up and they become more spiny looking because they're still attached to the other ones, but they're, they're kind of pulling away. So they get the spiny look. And then uh, finally, that granular layer here, just before they're ready to die, they, they, they stain a little bit darker. And so I'll show you a picture. Yeah, this shows it. See this kind of a darker purple look? That's the stratum granulosum granular. <clears throat> you guys think uh, basal layer down here, this is all going to be the stratum spinosum or spiny layer, a little bit of granulosum, and then this is all stratum corneum, the cornified or dead part above. You guys experts? Stratum basale, stratum spinosum, stratum granulosum, stratum corneum. In this case it's quite thick. All right, well, one uh, consequence of uh, um, having the blood supply only in the dermis, just so the blood vessels come up to here and they stop. And also this kind of arrangement, having it like that, allows more surface area, so more blood can reach those basal uh, skin layers that are constantly dividing and hungry, right?
Um, one consequence of this is that um, bed sores or these um, pressure sores can, can occur. And I always wonder what causes. I thought, well, it looks like it's going to be some kind of abrasion or something. But these are patients that are often quadriplegic or they, they don't move that much or they're in coma. And the issue is if you have constant pressure on part of your skin, it's going to push down and compress those blood vessels in the dermis. And that epidermis will start ne necrotizing or dying. So these are what these bed sores are like this, these types is that uh, it's, uh, constant pressure, usually on bony parts, elbows or your hip or uh, your elbow, that is constantly, if, if a patient is immobile, they're constantly pressing down, blood can't reach it, and the skin starts dying there. So in patients like this, you want to make sure you move them or there's mechanical things and massage the skin and don't let those um, bony parts like the heel constantly have pressure. All right, so strata and basale, look at these things. These cells, man, they're going through mitosis like crazy because they're making skin. Ah, oh, beautiful picture here. And so as it comes up, do you see these little connections here? Yeah, where the, the cell is kind of pulling away, but it's still attached to its neighbors. And so it has that kind of that spiny look. And so the cells are moving up. And the cells kind of this prickle or spiny, stratum spinosum layer. Yeah. That's most of your skin is that spinosum layer. And a little bit of granulosum where the stain really picks up the, the granules of keratin and uh, appears kind of darker right there. Yeah, there you go. Until finally this corneum, stratum corneum is this called cornified. I mean, yeah, this is the layer that is dead up there, dead skin cells. But again, it's got keratin and uh, it's a good, uh, you know, having a lipid in it, this, these dead skin cells, that it's a good waterproofing layer. You can overdo that. Or you get in a hot bath of soapy water and your skin swells up, you know, it gets all wrinkly. So you can overcome that. But normally water beads up on you, right? Comes right off. Yeah, and we'll see that corneum layer is, is thickest where you have the most abrasion you know you look at your feet and your palms and other places and if you have unusual places you can have calluses or, or corns that form on your toes and the callus is just you've the corneum layer gets really thick <clears throat> in response to constant um, friction there yep so these cells up here in the corneal layer are a nu no nucleus no organelles nothing they're just packed with keratin and what's left of the membrane that's what is the the outside of your skin. Yeah, and this looks more like the, the slide we had in histology for stratified squamous cornified, real thin skin. But that dark pink is the uh, keratin layer. And here's wicked thick skin, you can see that. All right, well I talked about this uneven border, how they come together unevenly, and that's nice, because it gives you a nice tight, uh, a nice fit there, right? So from the dermis below, each one of these little things that comes up, we call it a dermal papilla. A papilla is a little nubbin, a little nipple, a little thing. So this is the dermal papilla as it comes up, and the epidermis is going to meet it like that. And so they fit together beautifully. And it gives it strength against getting a blister and also increases that surface area because only the dermis has the blood and the nerves. And so it comes up and it allows the epidermis, lots of surface area to get, it needs all those nutrients because the cells are dividing, right? And in places that's going to give you where you really have these things, give you these ridges that you see on your hands and feet. So these dermal ridges we see in our, in our, in our fingerprints and our toe prints too. Um, you don't usually use that in um, forensics because people usually have shoes on, right? Okay. But um, the deal with, uh, with fingerprints, what we see is they are unique to people. Um, identical twins will have really close fingerprints, but even they have differences because fascinatingly, the uh, genetics will give you the basic idea of your, uh, these are these dermal papilla, but they're kind of lined up in ridges and it gives us some, uh, some grip, right? By having these fingerprints. But it also is formed in utero, just as these ridges are forming, uh, the fetus will touch uh, the uterus 
uh, in different ways and they'll cause little micro differences in your fingerprints. So that's what gives the uniqueness to fingerprints is that sure it's genetically based, but then it's also the environment. And that just depends on what the old fetus is doing and what it's touching and uh, is gonna give you the, the final touches to your unique fingerprints. When you look at this dermis, uh, technically we can talk about it having a papillary layer, it has these little papilla, and it's a little more, it's not as dense right there, it's a little more kind of areola, or kind of loose connective tissue. And the reticular layer, that's where you see the beautiful collagen fibers going every direction, right? Because you never know which direction your skin is going to be pulled. Um, so the reticular layer is dense, uh, irregular connective tissue. Papillary layer is also dermis and lots of fibers as well, but a little less and it's a little more of uh, looser with more blood vessels. Yeah. Well, I just told you dense irregular is going every which way, you know, and it appears that way when you get a section of skin. But you're only looking at a microscopic section. If you step back and look at your, all of your skin and your body, we have these lines, just like in, in, uh, in fabrics, we have a, a weave, a direction to the, the, to, the um, to the fabric, and it depends how it's gonna hang and things like that. Uh, in your body, we have these overall, again, looking up close, it looks chaotic, but if you step back, there's these generalized um, uh, weave to our skin based on the collagen directions. And surgeons know this in order, uh, when you want to make an incision, you want to go with the lines, not against the grain. Otherwise it will gap more, make more of a scar. So yeah, we have a general pattern to the collagen in our skin overall. Um, and that uh, allows us to, um, to know where to make incisions to, so it doesn't gape as much. And of course, I talked about collagen giving us the toughness. But there's elastic fibers too. You know if you pull your skin, it snaps back. And both collagen and elastic fibers, as you get older, you make less and less of them. So elderly people have much less elastic skin, much thinner skin, less fat. And we'll see how that's gonna provide wrinkles. But yeah, so our skin is a combination of mostly collagen, but also elastic fibers so that it snaps back. All right, well, one thing I wanna mention, you know, again, looking kind of big picture that I'll mention a disease is that um, skin, this dense collagen is just a step away from bone. When you make bone, well, we'll get to it. You, you lay down collagen in a, in a particular manner and then you in, infuse it with these uh, inorganic salts, the uh, calcium and phosphorus salts, and that makes it bone. So bone is a combination of those hard crystal salts and then collagen fibers. So in the animal world and, and then uh, in a certain disease, it's um, just a step away of turning flexible skin into bone. And so I have in my office, I can show you, I've got some of these scoots. The back of an alligator uh, has bone in the skin. And it's not like, oh, weird, you know, because skin can turn to bone easily evolutionarily, I'm just telling you. So a turtle, uh, the ribs are expanded, but then you make dermal bone too that fills it in. And armadillo and yeah so the leather the, the toughness to the dermis um, can turn into bone and that's what bring up the disease scleroderma that you may have heard of and of course sclera means hard <clears throat> derma is skin uh, and uh, this disease it's uh, it's thought to be autoimmune and it's where the collagen hardens and so you'll see it you know, especially in the fingers and such and there's a big array of scleroderma you can have systemic all around or more localized scleroderma and some is deadly and you have just years to live because it involves hard valves, other things become hardened. Other, But what it is, just to explain it, is that the collagen and connective tissue in your body hardens. And sometimes it's annoying on your skin, it can form streaks. Other times it's deadly when it really invades tissues that need to be flexible. So it's not necessarily genetic, there may be some proclivities to it, and we don't understand really a lot about scleroderma, and uh, there's many, many flavors of it uh, from, you know, all over. 
All right, and then just uh, quickly here, and then uh, then uh, I think we'll uh, I'll break this into a second lecture. Is blisters can form when we break down that nice? I talked about oh, this is really strong. Well, if you keep wearing those shoes that you've never worn before on that hike, uh, you're going to eventually break that down, and then fluid will build up between the epidermis and dermis, and that will be a blister. So when we break down that tight connection, uh, this blister forms, and all that fluid that you just want to pop, I guess you can. Some of you guys know more about that, athletic training and stuff, but um, I always like to pop it, drain that thing. All right, so we got the epidermis. We talked about those, those strata. We talked about the dermis and the, the strength of it. Now below that is a layer of mostly fat, and you're going to ha still have connections of those um, fibers will go through. So there's no like, you know, night and day sharp connection, but they just kind of meld into each other. But we have a layer of hypodermis, means under your dermis and uh, to where we store a lot of fat, as I said. And there can be muscles too. In a lot of animals, most animals except humans, they have a skeletal muscle in their skin. You think of a horse, you ever watch a horse and they, they get a fly in their butt and they can shake their skin or your cat can move its skin, right? Yeah. In humans, all that uh, dermal skin or hypodermal skin, um, we only have it in our face and down to our neck. So we have uh, muscles here. And so our facial muscles connect into the dermis of our skin to allow all these facial expressions. And we'll see you have a muscle platysma that comes down here too. You can kind of move the skin of your neck, right? But try that on your arm. You, know, you can't, you can move your arm muscles, but not in the skin, right? So we uh, humans really have a paucity of, uh, of hypodermal skin, uh, muscle there, but we retain it in our face and we have a naked face. So you can really see our expressions as well. Yeah. Now in that basal layer, besides the, uh, um, the stem cells that are making those keratinocytes or skin cells that come up and become spiny, about one in four to one to 10 are different. They're melanocytes. They're making melanin, which is your pigment. Yeah. So histologically, I mean, when we look at this slide, you'd have to be for a histology class, but you can tell the difference. They look a little different. And I like to look at it here. You can see it's almost like an octopus. These melanocytes, they make these long extensions that come up. And when sunlight hits them, when they're stimulated, there's some hormones can do it as well, they will produce melanin, <clears throat> this pigment, um, amino acid tyrosine, I think. They make this pigment, dark pigment, if it's you melanin, real melanin, and then that pigment will come up and they'll inject it in the nearby cells. And that's how you get a tan. And then so those cells will remain, remember that they're on their way to death. And so you're gonna lose the tan. It's never a permanent tan, but it's gonna protect the melanin, that dark pigment protects the DNA of the cells below it from UV radiation. So if you go out in a tanning bed or the sun, your body will react, your skin will say, damn, I'm gonna get, mutated DNA unless I protect myself. And so it makes this melanin. Yeah, so they're there, these melanocytes. They're just scattered about. Yeah, sure, gotten that tan before, definitely. Um, yeah, and we can uh, talk a little more about skin cancer, but uh, this increase in tanning that came about, tanning beds, how long has it been? 15 years ago, something like that, and produce a whole bunch of new uh, skin cancers. Um, definitely, it used to be thought to be healthy. You know, you go and tan. See, people put the oil on and the the uh, reflecting. You know, now it's people frown on that, right? I mean, sure, a lot of you out there still tan, right? And I like that feeling of a, a little bit of a tan, but but we know that <laughs> we know the dangers now. It's not like it's a mystery. Yeah, okay, yeah, well, I'm talking about skin color. Yeah, and, and hair color, yeah. So this coloration, we're all humans, we're all the same, but we, we vary, of course, in, our, in how, how dark our skin tone is and the color of our hair, all these things, and our eye color, right? And when you look, the deal with skin color is this. Um, we all began very dark skin, the human species, very dark skin in, in, in Africa. And then we migrated throughout the world. And as we migrated to Northern latitudes, we had an issue. The issue is always this. We have two factors we're worried about. One is we need protection from the sun so we don't get skin cancer. 
And so that's the darkness of our skin protects us from that. But we need enough sunlight to go through our skin to activate vitamin D so that we can absorb calcium, we can have strong bones. So that are the, those are the conflicting factors. And so as we move away from the sunny equator, our days get shorter. Here in Maine, right? We put vitamin D in our milk. We do all kinds of things. Um, as you move further away, we get lighter skinned because there's selection for lighter skin because those people could uh, absorb enough calcium. If you're too dark skinned, you couldn't. Now, as you move closer to the equator, that the, um, um, the calculation changes. And what's most important is protection from the UV radiation. So as we look today uh, at, at, at different skin colors uh, uh, throughout the world, we see the darkest skin colors in places in Africa, the Aborigines here in, the, in Southern India, the, the darkest skin tones, all close to the equator where there's lots of sunlight. You see some of the fairest skin we're looking at, uh, well, Scotland, you know, Norwegians, you look at lighter skin and hair and eyes, this loss of pigment as, uh, as we move further from the equator. So there's definitely that general pattern. Live where there's high sun intensity, darker skin to protect you. And you, as we move away, it'd be nice to be protected. We still want to be protected, but then we have this additional selective force saying that the lighter skin allows more sun to hit and to make us more vitamin D. And that's a strong influence that, that you don't think about that, that calcium absorption too. And so the key, what I want you to know is that the dark pigment is, is melanin, but you melanin, you means true melanin. It's dark, it's black, dark brown pigment that we make. And it's made of course by enzymes. And so you can have a genetic disease, a, well, a genetic issue, albinism being albino where of all the enzymes needed to make melanin, if there's anything wrong with them, you can't make that pigment and you end up with very light eyes and it could be any race, it'd be albino. But the other pigment is pheomelanin. Pheomelanin is a yellowish, reddish kind of tinge. Um, and so we all have a combination of those two. It's genetically based. So if you're redhead, let's say you make a lot of pheomelanin. If you have black hair, you make a lot of eumelanin. If you're blonde, you make uh, less of either. And uh, yeah, and so based on our genetics tells us our, 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 our hair color, we'll get to that, I guess. But in terms of skin color, um, both uh, very dark people and very light skinned people had the same number of melanocytes. What causes the difference in having dark versus light skin is um, how active they are, how much melanin they make, also turns out the melanin granules themselves. There'll be different sizes, bigger or smaller, and how quickly they degrade in your skin. So there's some other factors, but I want you to know white or black, we have the same number of melanocytes. It just varies in how active they are. And then the configuration of the, the melanin granules is also going to play into that as well. What also contributes to our skin color, I'm pale, Scottish, Irish, German, English kind of person, um, is um, uh, our blood too, blood supply. So it gives us kind of a pinkish hue, yeah, some of us, and uh, that'll come out more when you're embarrassed or drunk. And there's other reasons why, you know, that uh, more blood will be shunted to your skin. And uh, yeah, and if you eat tons and tons of uh, carrots, you can actually turn kind of yellowish, uh, especially babies. They just want to eat the carrot puree, yeah. But turn yellow, it can be kind of disturbing. And uh, it's okay, it's just the creatinines, they, 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 they gather in the fat under the skin and they, they kind of give off that color. But uh, babies often are born jaundice. And you should all know what jaundice is because it's a, it's a condition in adults too, is when you have a yellowish skin, especially the whites of your eyes will really show up there. But um, jaundice means you have bilirubin, you have pigment from your, uh, your liver and you know, it should go into your gallbladder into your bloodstream. And in adults, it's a sign of liver failure or some other uh, issues with gallbladder or liver. Um, babies is really quite common. Um, and then they usually grow out of it. Usually the liver is kind of immature as you're born. And so they're, they're born jaundice, kind of yellowish. And your book even mentions how they discovered a uh, nurse that when they brought out the jaundice babies in the sunlight, and they brought them back inside and took the diaper off like, oh, wait a minute, where the sun hit, they're cured of the jaundice. And it just shows where the sun didn't hit. So now they have these uh, little grow lights. They put babies in that are jaundice 
little goggles on. That will help break down the bilirubin early on. So John is very common in newborns. Uh, we'll get rid of that. As an adult, if you're jaundiced, you want to look at your liver. All right. And then I mentioned how the blood makes up part of your skin color as well. Uh, if you are low in oxygen, you'd be cyanotic. Cyan, remember, is the blue color in my crayons, cyan blue. Cyan blue is a color. So I remember it's blue. And so especially your lips, your fingernails will turn bluish under low oxygen conditions, right? Could be a lot of different issues there. Um, carbon monoxide poisoning or uh, lung issues or yeah, anything can cause you to be cyanotic that's gonna lower your blood oxygen. Yep. And then, you know, the red of our lips, it's not really, we got some pheomelanin, a little reddish pigment, but it's mostly blood. The blood vessels are close to the surface there. And so that really shows when you're cold, they'll turn bluish because the blood is moving slowly, a lot of oxygen is taken out of it, or bright red um, if you have enough oxygen. All right, uh, about, about time to take a break. We can see some skin here. You can tell the keratin's up here. Uh, these are the uh, cells you can see uh, making a lot of melanin. All right, I think we'll take a break here. And I'll pick up the next, uh, the next one when we um, um, we'll talk about uh, the nerves of the skin. We'll get to the hair and sebaceous glands and sweat glands. So, all right, you guys, hope you're doing great.